This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Eva International Media Limited. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Virts, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. Um, today we have an amazing guest. We're very fortunate to have U.S. Air Force retired General Philip Breedlove. Uh, General Breedlove is the former Supreme Allied Commander Europe, as well as the commander of the United States European Command, or what's known as SACUR and UCOM in the military acronym Na universe, or NATO. You may have heard of NATO before. Um, General Breedlove, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Terry. I look forward to our conversation. Uh, do we do call signs, by the way, or should we do General Breedlove? Uh, uh, either is fine with me. My All my uh, wartime and flying friends know me as Buana. <laughs> That's what everybody's like. You need to get Buana on the podcast. And I was like, oh, General Breedlove. Yes, I'll, I'll ask him to come on the podcast. Um, so, sir, we have a pretty similar background. I We both went to Willie for pilot training in, in Phoenix. We uh, flew F-16s at McDill and Korea and Germany. And then that, that's where the similarity stopped. I, I kind of hit a ceiling and you kept on going up. Uh, but we, we uh, so we have a little bit of similar background in the Air Force. Um, was getting that command of NATO unusual for an Air Force guy? Is that normally an Army job? Well, in the past, uh, very few Air Force people have done it. A, a few more admirals have done it, but it has been a very Army-centric command through the years. But of late, it's a pretty good smattering of uh, the different uh, types, but in the past right. five or six, it's been mostly Air Force and Army. Go Air Force. Um, well, I, I want to talk, obviously, we're going to talk about Russia and Ukraine today, and to put some context on it, um, and a lot of my podcast viewers may not be military people, probably, so um, I want to go from the 30,000-foot view of like how the U.S. wages war versus how the Russians wage war. And we, you know, John Warden and Iraq kind of is the modern paradigm for, I think, how we do war. We have what's known as joint and multi-domain warfare. We go in and we take out, you know, air defenses first, and then we go in after the army. And there's a certain way that the Americans do things. Importantly, we go out of our way to not bomb civilians. We really take a huge effort to not do that. And then there's the Russian way of war. And I'm just wondering if you could just talk about the differences. That seems to be kill civilians and use artillery, but there's a big difference, isn't there? There is a big difference. And uh, frankly, um, we I think we made some mistakes over the last, say, two decades, expecting that Russia had come into sort of our century and, and would think about waging war more like us um, and we and we were convinced, I think, by the Russians and what may now be, we understand to have been Moskarovka or uh, or uh, fooling us into thinking they had these capabilities. Uh, but in this war, they certainly have not demonstrated them. I have been pretty hard on them, and some real Russian scholars uh, have sort of talked me down off the ledge a little bit, saying that. Russia doesn't use its air force like we use our air force. The primary goal of its air force is to keep the opponent's air force down and off the battlefield. Whereas you described it very well, the United States Air Force wants to be a, a part of a joint team and do what we want call combined arms warfare, where we get synergistic effect from air, land, and sea fires all together. And, and we were sort of expecting Russia to use their military in that way. And they are either unwilling or unable to do it because this particular uh, war has shown us uh, the crude way that they fight. Mm -hmm. May I just say too that, that now I'm less surprised. I had a great friend at Georgia Tech where I teach a little bit in my retirement who asked me to come lecture his class on the Chechen Wars, the Georgian War, and the Ukrainian War. And if you go back to Chechnya 1 and 2 in Georgia, you're going to see exactly what we just saw in Ukraine. A land army that is truly unable of fighting a combined arms fight. Instead, they go to attrition-based, rubbleizing attack 
uh, and sort it out that way. It, it really is quite demonstrative when you look at it. In, in, in Syria too, right? Recently, very recently. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. Eastern Syria, the same thing. Flatten the city, sort out who's left living, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have two anecdotes, sir. I want to see what you think about these one. Well, first, when, when I was at uh, Spangdalam, we did this mill to mill program in the 90s. We were welcoming in the former Soviet states and a, and a, um, a Hungarian MiG-29 pilot came and I t showed him around and his eyes were very wide. We, I tried to fly him in the F-16 sim. He, he was literally not capable of flying straight and level in the F-16. He, he, the side stick, he just couldn't figure it out, which I've, I've never seen that ever. Um, and of course there was East German, uh, MiG-29 pilots at Laga and they, they just couldn't integrate them into the modern West German Luftwaffe. And when I was in, I spent I spent decades in Russia with NASA, um, flying on the International Space Station. And after each sim, uh, you'd have a debrief. You know, it'd be a long four hour long simulation, and uh, there'd be a debrief just like we have debriefs flying F 16s And the purpose of the debrief, the cosmonauts would fight tooth and nail, fight to the death to make sure they weren't blamed for any mistake ever. There's this Russian saying called "Kotovinovat ashtodiela." which means who's guilty and what do you do about it? Going back to Stalin, of course, the guy gets shot. Whoever's guilty for whatever didn't happen, right? Somebody gets blamed for, right? So there's this culture that I think is just incapable of doing well <laughs> at modern things. Um, is that, do you see, I mean, you were the boss of like <laughs> of the whole thing, right? So. Well, they, they, they have some things that they do well, and, and right now, I would say almost all of those are in the gray zone fight. I think they're using social media as an mm. extremely sharp tool, and they're having great effect in social media. I think they use uh, Moskarovka to hide their offensive actions and all the other gray zone areas. And uh, they fight in these indirect ways very well. But what they've proven to us is in a conventional head-to-head -head sort of combat situation, they aren't very uh, good. And, and frankly, um, it, it, what we see again in Ukraine playing out is something we should have anticipated looking at uh, Chechnya, Georgia, et cetera. Right. Nobody makes um, decisions. That's the thing, because they're afraid they're going to get sent to the gulag or shot. And is that why we've taken out so many generals because the captains and lieutenant colonels don't make decisions and the general has to go up front and go, Hey, attack that hill. And then we, sh is that what's going on with those guys? Do you think that all this? I don't know. Research? I've heard pretty learned people describe it a little differently. The, the, um, the Russians came into this war with a very disassociated command and control network, the strategic loss on the North side of Kiev, and then the strategic loss vicinity, Kharkiv. And now the sort of operational, soon to be strategic losses, I think, in the South were initially characterized by very poor command and control and very poor communication. And so they had to push the generals forward to get up there and try to command and control the units and get mm -hmm. them moving. And that put them in the direct line of fire. That's what I heard right. was the biggest explanation for why so many generals dying. And yeah. I mean, that, that was crazy. So to, so to talk about, I think most people know, generically, um, they tried to attack all of Ukraine at once. That didn't go very well. They got that 40-mile long uh, line of trucks. Every hog driver in the world was just fangs were out drooling, and, and we didn't do anything about it. Anyway, they regrouped, and they've come into the four provinces that they, uh, they annexed. They'll be part of Russia forever, except for in, until this week. Um, so that's kind of the big picture. But what do you think of um, how it's going? Has this turned into Korea where there's going to be a stagnated stalemate for three years? Or is it still dynamic and are the Ukrainians still moving? It, so what happens in Ukraine right now is absolutely dependent, in my mind, on how the West mm -hmm. supplies Ukraine. Mm -hmm. If the West continues to support Ukraine in the manner that I think they absolutely deserve, then Ukraine will defeat Russia and they will move them off Russian soil. Now, we should probably have a little bit of a subtle conversation about Crimea 
but I'm talking <laughs> in the not too distant future. I think uh, Ukraine can absolutely take back the continental part of, of Ukraine. Again, if the West continues to supply Ukraine in the manner in which I believe they deserve. And let's, so, let's... no, I hear all of this, Balihu, and I think that's a lot of uh, uh, Mr. Putin trying to put out some more Moskarovka and Huey to convince us to give up on supplying them that they're going to bog down this winter. I, if you saw about three days ago now, two to three days ago, we had a great statement from I think he was just a colonel, but he was the leader of one of the toughest and most successful units down there on the line. And he basically said, no, we're not going to stop. This isn't going to stop. We're winning. We're going to keep right. pressing. We're not going to give them respite to refit and refurbish. And so the fighting spirit of the Ukrainians is there. I believe they have the will and determination to continue to move forward. And I think that, uh, if we continue to supply them, they will uh, handle the Russians on the continental piece of Ukraine. Well, so you mentioned the the winter, and there. Well, so first of all, Russia has a history with winter and, and Napoleon and, and Hitler. But the thing about the winter is the ground's frozen, and you can have maneuver warfare, right? In the in the spring or in the when it's rainy season, you can't because it's all mud. So although there's this word out that well, in the winter time it'll stop, but that seems like a good fighting time, at least for ground maneuver. Anyway, the Air Force well, it, can fly. Yes, anytime. it's easier. It's easier for tracked and some wheeled vehicles to move once the ground is frozen. You know, they're going through the muddy period now. Right, Their winter right. goes mud, ice, mud. Right. And the muddy period is going to be tough for everybody, but the Ukrainians are still moving forward. Right. Remember, this is their country. They right. understand where they can go and where they right. can't go. And they're fighting an existential fight for the very heart of their country. So mm -hmm. I think the Ukrainians will manage to keep pressing Russia. I, I like the way Zelensky puts it. If, if the Russians stop fighting, the war ends. If Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends. Um, yeah. Well, but I want to talk real quick about the weapons because anybody who follows, all 10 people who follow me on Twitter have known I've been very loudly uh, advocating for this. On February 25th, I was jumping up and down on Twitter saying that we need to send them Patriots, we need to send them ATACMs, um, and it just took forever. And we, you know, if everybody said, well, it's going to take too long to train their pilots. Well, it's been nine months. You can learn how to fly an F-16. If you're a MiG-29 pilot, you can learn how to fly an F-16 in a couple months, you know. So I, I've heard... Um, I've had sources tell me that Jake Sullivan has slowed things down. We've done great. America has supplied them. We've allowed this to happen. I, I'm very thankful for the Biden administration, but I've been very frustrated that it didn't happen sooner and quicker. And if we had given them better SAMs, Ukraine, a lot of Ukrainians would be alive right now. I mean, it's that level of, you know, I, I feel very strongly. And I, I just want to hear your thoughts about what should we be giving them? How quickly can we give them, you know, that kind of thing, specifics, if you can. So, yes, so um, the, let's try to not um, uh, make this uh, political because everybody is now dividing into, they got one, one bunch of people right. labeled the war council and another bunch of people uh, right. labeled Putin's cronies and all, you know, the politicians are trying to divide this up and turn this into a po political thing. And that's the absolute worst outcome we could have. The fact of the matter is we, uh, have been giving Ukraine a lot. A lot. And like you, I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. But we have not given them some things they absolutely need. And you mentioned several of them. You know, the HIMARS with the Gimler missile has been very good for them. We need to give them ATAC. Uh, their Air Force, small as it is, has done a pretty good job of keeping the Russians at bay. But the Air Force is for more than keeping the enemy's airplanes at bay. The Air Force is for pounding the enemy on the ground to support your ground scheme of maneuver. And we have not given Ukraine that ability yet. And I believe we should. And you're right. In nine months, we could have trained a lot of pilots to be flying fourth or fourth plus generation uh, aircraft that could have made uh, a lot of progress. 
part of the army we're fighting in the east now was the army we allowed to escape the mud in the north. If we'd have went in there and buried every single one of them in that mud, we wouldn't have had to fight them again in the east. And so we brought this on ourselves by not enabling Ukraine to take care of that force on the north side of, of, um, of uh, Kiev. And I, I've said more than once, the highway of death out of Kuwait would have been a walk in the park compared to what would have happened to the, to the Russian army on the north side of, of, of Kiev when it was mm -hmm. stuck in the mud. Mm -hmm. it, it would have been just annihilated by a capable air to ground support military. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be giving them ATACMs, but before you give them ATACMs, we first need a policy to allow them to return fire on Russians. Right. Remember now that we allow Russia, we allow Russia to pound Ukraine from almost 300 degrees on the compass. Yeah. All the way from Belarus in the north around to Crimea mm -hmm. and the northern Black Sea in the south. But we refuse to allow uh, um, um, Ukraine to return fire even against just the military targets in Russia. So we have given Russia safe haven in this war. We have literally explained to Russia, you can keep doing what you're doing, and we're not going to let the Ukrainians fire back at you. That's craziness. We need to revert that policy. And then we need to enable the Ukrainians to be able to strike. Um, you don't go into a tennis match agreeing to receive serve for the whole match. <laughs> you go into a tennis match planning to serve. Mm -hmm. And we are telling the Ukrainians, you're going to receive serve for the whole match. You cannot mm -hmm. return fire. Right. And that's, that's just crazy. So I think better and more coastal defense cruise missiles, better and more air defense, and especially tactical ballistic missile defense and cruise missile defense missiles, better and more long range artillery and offensive air. That's mm -hmm things I think we need to be given. Amen. So I, I wish, all, I hope all those things happen as soon as possible. The, the, Iran, the Iranian drones, these kamikaze drones have thrown an interesting wrinkle because apparently they can make a lot of them and you don't want to be shooting down $100,000, you know, uh, the drones with million dollar SAMs. That's not sustainable in the long term. So I, it seems like there's a need for a uh, low quality drone defense, you know? Well, well, actually they're doing a pretty good job with that. There are uh, these drones getting through, mm -hmm. but the Ukrainians are shooting down uh, quite a bit of them, mm -hmm. especially this, I think it's only $25,000, this small one that's done yeah. some pretty big damage. But, and they're shooting a lot of those down with the Gepards and other uh, uh, surface to air capabilities that are, are relatively cheap. But you're right. We, we are on the backside of the cost curve at right. getting after the bigger capability drones out of Russia and out of Iran. And so here's the, here's the bottom line. And you know this, Terry, you've been there. So it's, uh, I'll just try to describe it quickly. Shooting down drones or shooting down ballistic missiles or shooting down um, cruise missiles, these are all tough problems. And in the West, we seem to think about the big, shiny, in-game shoot-down mechanism. Oh, uh -huh. we just gave them Gepper. Oh, we just gave them, you know, the, the, the new uh, capability or whatever. Uh -huh. And in fact, it's really about the systems of systems that get you there. You have to have a great set of sensors uh -huh. that can see and hear in many spectrums to uh -huh. locate these things. And then you have to cue someone to shoot them. It may be as simple as cueing a uh, battery of man pads that they're coming from this direction and they're going that direction they're at this altitude so they know where to look. Or it may be cueing some high-end capabilities, wh wh which we're beginning to give them. But the, the big deal is if you've got a great high-end system sitting in the middle of the field working autonomously, its probability of kill is somewhere here. If you have a great system of sensors, command and control, and queuing, 
that makes that in-game mechanism, then the PK is way up. Right. And so we need to think about the system to allow them to attack drones, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles, and start looking at what they have and not what they don't have. Right. Um, that reminds me, you know, going back to Iraq and John Warden, you know, we took out their eyes first. We took out the radar sites and the the flap lids and all that stuff first. Um, and also going back to 2015, when the Russians shot down the the airliner, the Malaysian Air, that was due to a, probably a complete lack of of quality command and control systems. Um, do you what the Russians are doing now, largely besides the artillery battle on the front lines, is bombing civilian infrastructure, uh, electricity, fuel depots, and they've been doing. I don't know how Ukraine is still. I mean, they've been bombing this stuff now for what nine months. Um, are those, in your judgment, are those? Is that a war crime to bomb a civilian electric power plant? And is that going to work against the Ukrainians? Uh, I don't think it's a war crime. I mean. The bottom line is uh, we've done that in our past. And one of the things we look at when we want to take somebody down, like if we were going to take down Kalinowicz, we would have similar, similar schemes of trying to turn the lights out, turn the power off, shut down their radars and all those sort of things. Listen, Russia is, is, can, is doing tons and tons and every day they're committing war crimes because of the things they are targeting and because of the people they're murdering, the women they're raping, the children they're kidnapping and sending back to Russia to right. repopulate the Slavic race in Russia, the murder, the shooting in the back of the heads and dumping them in ditches. Russia is committing horrendous war crimes every day, but attacking an infrastructure like fuel infrastructure, electrical power and stuff like that, I'm not sure that's a war crime. Now, clearly what they're doing is they're trying to create hardship for the Ukrainians. This is less about winning the war by destroying a capability. This is more about making a people uh, miserable and trying to separate them from Zelensky. So I don't know if that intent changes it or not. I think you'd have to talk to a lawyer. Right. But uh, as far as bombing power and fuel and all of that stuff that's that i think is is a is a normal act of war i, I would right. have to be corrected maybe would it um would so the other stuff you mentioned killing people i they're liberating Kherson. i was just reading this morning about they found a torture chamber it's amazing how just brutal they are um are would do you think that rises to the level of genocide there it feels like to me like they're trying to stop you well it feels like it because putin said they're trying to stop ukraine from existing and yeah. should putin go to the hague be brought before a tribunal at the hague well there's more than enough war crimes already committed in ukraine right now there doesn't have to be one more committed mr right. putin should face tribunal in the hague there's right. no doubt about that um and uh, i don't think you have to go to genocide I, I think, I mean, you remember the horrible letter from the mother in Russia telling her son it's okay to rape Ukrainian women. I mean, this is craziness. It's and crazy. So, and, and where have all of the kids gone that have been hauled out of Mariupol and, and other places in, um, in, in Ukraine? This, this, this is an example of inhumanity at its highest, this war yeah. that Mr. Putin is putting on. I, it, it, it makes my head explode to see the evil happening. It's like they're going back. It's not even the 18th. I, in every way, it's it, Putin is Hitler. Whatever Putin says, the opposite is true oftentimes. And they're saying they need to denazify Ukraine when actually they actually need to denazify Russia. That's where the problem is. Um, do you think we should send U.S. troops there, even in the rear areas, to man patriots or to help with ATACMs? Or should American troops be, you know, publicly in the nation of Ukraine, even in a support capacity? So there was a time where I advocated for just that. Mm -hmm. um, 
in the and I have recently, but not very recently, even advocated for helping in a supply way. You know, I've been over to Romania and Poland and, mm. and a lot of stuff comes up there and then it has right. to get taken care of and moved in. And I often suggested that we, maybe not U.S. soldiers, but maybe we should be contracting like we did in, in Afghanistan and Iraq with a big firm to move some of that stuff forward to ease the burden on the Ukrainians. But I actually, we believe we are past now the point of needing American soldiers on the ground. Listen, Ukraine's military is whipping them. Yeah. They are whipping them. We just need to give them the right stuff to whip them harder. What a bargain this is. So how, like for tens of billions of dollars, which is a lot. And I'm really thankful that the Biden administration is doing this. We're defeating one of the worst authoritarian democ- or nations on earth for tens of billions of dollars it, for 10 percent of our budget. It's amazing. Don't you agree? Is that this not and it's not our blood. It's Ukrainian. So, blood so that's just, doing it. just think about this. We are we are we, we are at peace. I don't agree with that myself. The enemy gets a vote and the enemy is attacking us in this in the gray zone every mm-hmm. single day. Yeah. But we are not kinetically fighting Russia. Russia is fighting us on every level. And so here we are spending this amount of money. And I think you should just go back to World War II or maybe even just Korea or or whatever, and just take a week or three days of what those wars were costing us and balance that against what we are spending in the last nine months in Ukraine. I mean, this Yes, it's a lot of money. And yes, there's other places we could spend it. But it is, uh, it is money that is causing great damage to a world power that is willing to use its army to cross internationally recognized borders and take land from its neighbors. And we are helping to defeat that army. I, I think it's an investment well taken. I, I agree, sir. So what should, what, should, what should be done on the political front? We heard even the, from the chief staff, you know, potentially he was advocating, negotiating. Um, before this thing, you talked, you had some thoughts on this. Should we be negotiating with Russia? Is now the time to... Well, negotiate? I think that uh, that Jake, our, our uh, national security advisor, has cleared that up pretty well. If you looked at Jake's last uh, remarks, he did an interview on the airplane going over with the president. And the words that he used, I think, were uh, very uh, clear. And and if that is our government's intent, I'm happy. Uh, he said we are not pushing them. We are asking them to consider, you know, negotiations, but negotiations under the conditions that that Kiev could accept. And Mr. Zelensky has already laid what that out is, and that is all Russians out of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And so I think right now we need to keep um, keep focused on supporting uh, Ukraine in this existential fight for their very country. Mm-hmm. Um, what what do I think we need to do? We've just gone through an ugly election, fought in the ugliest of ways, and um, it's time. We you know it's too big for me as a military person to say it's time to heal and fix America. But here's what I do know. We have had for so many years now, good bipartisan support of what is needed for our national defense. And we've got pretty good and still pretty strong support (laughs) for what needs to be done for uh, Ukraine. But we got this group on this side and this group, they're both on the outside edges. We Mm -hmm. got this group on the outside edge over here in this group on the outside edge over here that are beginning to speak out uh, about Ukraine. And like I said, one side's label in the other, the war party and the other side's label in the other Putin's cronies mm-hmm. and Putin's support team and all that sort of stuff. This is not helpful. We need to grow up and look at what's needed for our national security and what's important to this world about these these kleptocratic or autocratic governments who are deciding to use their militaries again to sh- change the shape of the world. And we need to get about doing what's right. 
for those situations. I, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I, I almost felt optimistic after these elections because people didn't vote for the crazies. Like the, I'm a math guy, so I believe in the bell curve. I think most people are in the middle and the the crazies for the mo- they didn't succeed that well. So I was I was really ha- happy about the American election in some ways. Um, to me, this feels like a military problem that, and it requires a military solution, but sanctions are part of it. And I, a couple, two things for sanctions. Here are my thoughts. I'll see what you think. I think that we should be doing anything we can to lower oil prices, even if that means letting Russian oil flow. The lower the price, the best way to hurt Russia is to lower the oil price. So we shouldn't, I think we should be focused on getting crude oil and other commodity commodities prices need to come down. That will hurt the Russian economy the most. Um, Saudi didn't agree with that, which well, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and then the other thing is no one has ever mentioned this, but why don't we sanction nations that buy Russian weapons? That's the most direct way to stop you know, money from funding Russian weapons is to sanction countries that buy Russian weapons. So Oil prices, weapons, Saudi, just your thoughts on this. Well, well sanctions in general first. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, learned people will, will agree and write the same way that I do. Sanctions have hurt Russia. Sanctions have hurt the Russian people. Sanctions have hurt the Russian economy. But sanctions have never, one more time, sanctions have never changed Mr. Putin's actions. Uh So our measure of merit is what Mr. Putin is doing. And we haven't changed that yet. Now, I stand by those words, but we're beginning to see fracturing around Mr. Putin. And maybe the result of those sanctions will end up uh, in that other people will change Mr. Putin's behavior. But one more time, sanctions have never changed Mr. Putin's behavior. Um, as far as the the oil prices, I I I, uh, I'm ne- I neither agree or disagree with what you said. Here's what I believe: we, excuse me, we absolutely have the capability to be energy independent, and in fact, to export energy. That would drive pals- uh, that would drive prices down, and it would put Americans back to work. I think we correct this oil problem inside our own country. That's my two cents. Okay. How about uh, sanctioning countries that buy Russian military equipment? That's a tough uh, one because that's China and India. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I, again, I would be careful because then people would want to sanction countries that buy American stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that, uh, I, I don't know. I. I'm not sure I'd go there, Terry, but, okay. but it is certainly a thought. Um, and I'm not a sanctions expert. I'm, you know, I'm just throwing these ideas out. Um, nukes, nuclear weapons is a, let's talk about that because that's obviously a huge issue. I don't think that Putin, I don't think his generals are insane enough to launch nuclear attacks against us, but who knows? Um, but he said when he threatened them a few months ago, I guess it was, he said, this is not a bluff. Um, and he's been saying he's going to do things for years, and he does them. So, um, I do you like if Putin gets cornered, is he going to launch a nuke? There, there's a whole universe of discussion about nukes. I just would like to hear your thoughts on that. So, I honestly, uh, I'm right in the middle now. Uh, I was very much on the side of he'll never do this, and then I went there at the height of his rhetoric to the point where it was like, holy moly, this guy might actually be crazy enough to do this. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you. Now, things are starting to fray around him. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure, you know, how that would work. But, but nukes, I think about in a bigger way. And I, I think that, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to make some tough decisions at some point. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. You can argue about who was responsible for that, how it progressed or whatever, but um, Russia invaded Georgia. They, they in, occupied about 20% of the land in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And then when the world started to raise its ire, Russia threatened, it, and I like to say it this way, having raised three kids and now raising two grandkids, 
uh, he huffed and he puffed and he <laughs> threatened to blow our house down. And we backed down. Right. We acquiesced and allowed him. We rewarded his bad behavior and let him hang on to the land in Georgia. Then in 2014, he used his military to invade Ukraine. He uh -huh. occupied somewhere around 12% of Ukraine. And when the West began to react to that, he huffed and he puffed and he threatened to blow our house down with those nukes. And we acquiesced and rewarded his bad behavior for a second time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's worked for him twice. Why are we surprised that he's back now in 2022 and he's beginning to lose the war and he's huffing and he's puffing and he's threatening to blow our house down with nukes? because he absolutely expects us to acquiesce and give up again and reward his bad behavior a third time by allowing him to hold on to yet more of Ukraine. And so I sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because I am. I think we have to do something about this or we'll be back in three more years and then three more years and then three more years mm -hmm. and then three more years. As yeah. long as it works, why would he quit? He won't. He won't. So at some point, we're going to have to stand him down. But having said all of that, it would be irresponsible to tell the people of the world that there is no risk. Frankly, I believe there's risk in allowing him to continue on this path. Mm -hmm. And we need to just figure out how we're going to measure and which risks we're going to accept and then we move out. I think it would be ill uh, of us to continue to allow him to, for a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth times, to seize land, huff and puff, stand us down, and then prepare for the next one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that very, very well said. If you let the bully stand up to you, you don't stand up to the bully, he's going to keep on bullying you. Like in Christmas story, when he, you know, Ralphie finally loses it and punches the bully and then he backs down. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to see the new Christmas story movie, by the way. Uh, but when you, when you talk about nukes, you hear about these battlefield nuclear weapons and people kind of dismiss, oh, that's just a tactical nuke. That's not a strategic nuke. That's not a five megaton destroy New York. That's just a battlefield. Well, the battlefield nukes are often the size of Hiroshima or Nagasaki, those bombs. I mean, these are not small there are, I think there are some really small bombs, but anyway, I think that. Well, I, I like the construct uh, that Senator Sam Nunn and others have penned, and they still still talk about if you're very familiar with their NTI nuclear threat initiative work that that's Senator right Nunn and others are, are doing. And the main thing that they say, and now you see this language starting to creep into Western writing, and that is you cannot fight and win a nuclear war, mm -hmm. you know? And so the tactical nukes, the question is, do you think, does, does Mr. Putin thinks he can fight and win a war if he starts popping tactical nuclear weapons? And so, um, you know, this is a, a very dangerous thing, even a tactical nuke. And there are, as you know, ways for them to use a tactical nuke that have almost no impact. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, popping one off out in the water over the Black Sea, pop popping one off in the middle of the of the forest. Uh, uh, air burst versus ground burst. Um, well, if the air burst is way away from you know right. land, that's probably not a problem. But you know what EMP does if right. from an air burst. So right. we got to be careful there. But there are ways that they could pop one off, and that's what scares me is that they would breach that level because they think they can get away with it. And uh, I agree with Senator Nunn and others in the fact that you cannot fight and win a nuclear war. It's an unwinnable war. I hope I hope Putin's generals understand that. And they, when he gives the order, they're like, no, sir, we're not doing that. And I, so we'll see. Um, in tw I have a quick story. In 2015, I was on the space station. And by the way, when they annexed Crimea, my immediate reaction, and I'm an active duty officer and NASA astronaut, so I couldn't say a word out loud. But my immediate thought was we need to build out the pipelines and the terminals to send American natural gas to Europe. And that that would hurt them in the pocketbook. That's what we should have done from the beginning. More than any sanctions, just undercut his natural gas flow. But 
I'm in, in space with my Russian cosmonaut friend. We're looking out the window one night and we're watching red flashes in, in the Donbass in Eastern Ukraine. We're watching Russians kill Ukrainians from the space station. It was a profound moment. Um, my cosmonaut friend who was floating right next to me, looking out the window with me, is now in the Duma, along with two, three cosmonauts that I flew with in space for in the Duma, promoting the war. Um, another cosmonaut I flew with is Crimea is ours, Crimea is ours. He's a big promoter of that. Um, several cosmonauts on the space station just a few months ago. They wore yellow and blue suits. That wasn't Ukraine. That was the color of their college. They, they actually gave a greeting, you know, promoting their Russian army friends on the ground. So my point is, these should be the most enlightened humans on the planet and yet they're promoting this horrendous war they know what's going on they spend time in america these are not poor partisan you know countryside dirt farmers these are the most educated people on earth so i've been advocating that we back away from cooperation with russia on the space station you can't completely cut it off because it's half their modules are attached you can't completely cut it off but we're launching americans on the soyuz just a couple weeks ago we launched a russian on a SpaceX, we don't need to be doing that level of cooperation. Just want to, it feels like it's 1942 and we're doing an Arctic expedition with Germans, which of course we wouldn't be doing, but that's what we're doing. Just your thoughts on that. Well, um, I, I completely understand what you're saying. I want to draw one line. Um, I, I do believe that we need to ostracize Russia in every venue we have. I uh, wrote not very long ago that we need to start proceedings to, uh, to remove Russia from the Security Council. And people said, you can't do that. I said, you can't do that right up until the point where you do that. Right, exactly. So we need to look at doing that mm -hmm. and uh, maybe even throwing them out of the UN. I mean, the, this country and the leadership of this country uh, have gone beyond the pale in inhumanity in mm -hmm. this war and they need to be ostracized. But I want to draw one line. Okay. When I was the Sector uh, and the Russians went into uh, um, Ukraine in 2014, um, I was told first by NATO and then second by the United States to stop talking to my counterpart. I had a regular uh, series of phone calls with Gerasimov. It hadn't been going that long, but it was an initiative that he and I had put together. And I was told to stop. And I believe that's the wrong direction. When we have, uh, when we have uh, combat or we are approaching combat situations or we're in incredibly tense situations, that's when military should be talking more rather than less. So yes, I agree with you, Terry. In other areas, we need to be ostracizing Russia for exactly what its leaders are. I don't believe all the Russian people are there with them, but we need to ostracize that nation in every single way imaginable. But when it comes to mill to mill mm -hmm. conversations, I think you need more rather than less. I, I couldn't agree more. So the, I think Lloyd Austin and, and uh, Shoigu should be on the phone every day. Hey, anything to update? Nope. Okay. And click. If, it, if that's all they do, at least they're actually saying words to each other. I couldn't agree more, but we're sending Americans on a Soyuz. I mean, Brittany Griner's got nine years in jail for having a gram of whatever. Um, who's to say that this NASA team that we keep in Russia isn't going to have the same thing? And we don't let China on the space station, I, I, I think, for good reasons. So why do we? It's not that we're going to completely cut off everything, but we shouldn't be going above and beyond, which is what we seem to be doing. Um, and I, the other thing, I, I wonder how you feel about this. The day that Putin, let's say Navalny comes into power for some reason, or the day that Russia stops doing what they're doing, I think we welcome them back into the community of nations. Um, like, is there, are you saying that Russia has gone forever and that they can never be redeemed or uh, in my no, view? I don't, yeah. I don't think they are gone forever. And I do think at some point they could be redeemed, but you missed one important point and that's reparations. Yes. Russia, let's talk about reparations. Yes, I have. Russia has just ripped up Ukraine mm -hmm. in their in their crazy form of attrition, flat knit, sort out the living kind of warfare. And they need to pay for that. 
when we were talking about diplomatic negotiations earlier, what I meant to say was, I think we should be negotiating how much reparations Russia is going to pay. That's the one thing they should be negotiating. <laughs> Um, not does Russia keep the Donbass, but how much are they going to pay for what they've done? Talk about the, in my mind, I, and I've been doing a lot of speaking since I left NASA, and I've, I used to say it feels like it's 1930 and 1940 is not that far away. Well, it feels like it's 1941 right now, and it's become democracy versus authoritarianism. It's very clear. So let's look at the year 2100. Like, how do you see things going? Is authoritarianism going to win? Is democracy going to win? Do you, do you see that same battle? Or do you have some like, do you have some very big picture thoughts on what's happening in the world? Well, I, I am normally more than a glass half full. I am, a, <laughs> my friends know me as a very positive minded person. But on this matter, I'm not a glass half full. I think democracy is in retreat. And, um, and it's bad out there, quote unquote, but all we have to do is look internal to some of the best democracies, quote unquote, that we have. Uh, they are eating themselves alive internally. Mm -hmm. Some of them are turning to socialism uh, straight up. And, and I think democracy is, uh, has got some really bad decades ahead. And, and frankly, until our government and our nation cleans its act up, I, I, my pessimism is going to continue. If we can't make it work in the most free and amazing country in the world, then we're in trouble. And right now, I'm not sure our democracy is working. What, what do you think we can do? One of the things I think we should do is, is promote the middle of the bell curve and minimize the ends things like open primaries uh rank choice voting whatever there's different mechanisms you can promote candidates that appeal to everybody not just the thing what are your thoughts on that two most important things to do is fix gerrymandering yes <laughs> and adopt term limits we Amen. need to take the power away from the politicians and remind them that they're public servants not Amen. little uh not little thieves. Uh, right. Thieves. They are public servants. And another thing I would do is give uh, give our uh, lawmakers the very same medical system and the very same retirement system that they give soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. What a what a concept! Um, I love that a lot. I I would advocate, I've been advocating for for an amendment to have an eighteen year term limit for the Senate, House, and Supreme Court, and that would mean that each president gets two terms um, or two nominations. You don't like that? You That's think less? too long. Well, eight, for the Supreme Court, it gives everybody two nominations. No, no, Supreme Court, I got, I got that. But okay. you said Congress, right? I was going to just make it easy because if it's complicated, then no one understands it. But 18 years is a long time. It's more I than enough it's time. too long. Yeah. Congress, I think, maybe... Term limits, good ones would be six years in the House and one term in the Senate. I, that's better than what we have now. <laughs> I'm not, you know, we just need some kind of term limits. I agree. And people say, well, you have term limits, they're called elections, but for a million reasons, we're not going to get into it, that that just doesn't work. Um, sir, one final thing I want to talk about, and that's collective responsibility. Um, you know, after World War II, the German people had some responsibility. The Japanese people had some responsibility. They say that maybe 20% of Russians violently support the war. 20% of Russians are like Navalny and they really oppose the war. And the vast majority, as long as it's not affecting them, they just don't care. When the mobilization happened, there was anger, but it wasn't because of what they were doing to Ukraine. It was because they didn't want to go fight. It was not you know, morally good what they were doing. What do you think about collective responsibility? Um, I'm not there yet with the Russian people, partially because Mr. Putin so controls the narrative. The Russian people get the vast majority of their news from their TVs and the Russian uh, establishment, the, mm. the political establishment is fully in charge of those. Yeah, I, I, I'm not there yet with the Russian people. But, but you I are with reparations. You, yes, there's a there's a that layer from about 20 percent up in russia they own it they yeah. they need to own it and they need to pay for it right but you said reparations that would come from the russian people well 
first of all, from the oligarchs, I think the very first thing we ought to do is freeze and use every penny outside of Russia that they have. Right. Start spending it right now on fixing Ukraine. Yeah, on buying diesel generators so they don't freeze to death this winter. That's There's true. a lot they need money now, not in 2025 to rebuild neighborhoods. Yeah. Pretty proud of what some of our engineers and our uh, you know, I'm a civil engineer, so let me toot civil engineering horn. <laughs> Several of the leading civil engineering societies in America have determined rightfully that um, that Ukraine's gonna need engineers to rebuild it when this is over. They're going to need so much, there and they're is losing an effort now to educate two thousand engineers in America and send them home. Oh wow! And who does system, that? Who does that? Well, the colleges, universities. Oh, oh, okay. And they raise money to do it. And my right. school, Georgia Tech, which has the largest civil engineering school in the nation, and the yeah. number two ranked civil engineering school in the nation, we're going to train about two hundred of those uh, folks. So the these, the Kiev universities will pick the students, send them over, and uh, all across America, schools will be training these folks and sending them home to help them rebuild their country. And I think it's a, a great first start. That's a great idea. That's exact. That's a very practical. I love that idea. Um, so any other, anything else you want to add? I know that we've talked about uh, lots and lots of stuff. Any other final thoughts about anything? So so I would just say that I think it's really important here in America that we lead the Western world to support Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is not perfect. Everyone asks me, well, what about the corruption in Ukraine? And I ask them, what about the corruption in America? Right here, yeah. <laughs> right here in this right. country. Right. And so um, we uh, have come a long way with Ukraine. We have a good system to track what we do and how we do it and where our stuff goes. And uh, it's not perfect, but it's pretty dang good. And we need to remember that Russia is the aggressor mm -hmm. and that they have brutalized the people of Ukraine and they have zero regard for the country of Ukraine. And so Russia needs to be held accountable. And the way to start doing that is help Ukraine finish what it looks like they are doing quite well. And that is defeating the Russian army. in the field. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have said it better myself, sir. I hope you can continue the work. I appreciate seeing you on the news uh, cast. You're, you're on the news quite often over the last nine months and keep up that work. Um, people in America need to hear that message because yeah, it's a lot of money and why are we doing this and we have inflation and there's a really, really, really good reason we're doing it. So I appreciate those words. And thanks for your time. This It's not often we get to have the uh, commander of NATO on, on the podcast. So I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I will see you around and thank you for your time, sir. Thanks. See you, Terry. Bye-bye.